we want to begin uh, actually reading at verse 12, if you would, with me, and uh, we will uh, read down through and include verse 15. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Why do you look so intently at us as though by our own power or godliness we made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just, and you asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are all witnesses. In the name of Jesus, would you reveal yourself to us? Could we be standing in that crowd? Could we feel and know the sense and sense the movement of your spirit as Peter delivers the words that were so strong and lives were changed how could they not be because you were alive and moving be that here in this hour are you not the same today as you were then I believe in Jesus name I pray amen He's given an awful picture of sin. We've walked through this picture somewhat, but it just continually <clears throat> grips me. Peter is standing before a group of people. There's probably eight, eight to 10,000 of them who've gathered, gathered into the porch. The man who's been healed, the lame man, the beggar, he's been holding on to Peter with everything he's got. Peter has turned to the crowd and is giving explanation about what's actually taking place. The crowd has thought and has accredited him with the miracle because it was his hand and his voice and he wasn't participating in it, so they thought it was all about him. Peter rebukes that idea with everything he's got and points to Jesus. And as he talks to Jesus, talks about Jesus to them, he, of course, is talking about the one they crucified. And he gives this awful picture of their sin, what this crowd had done. It's interesting, again, I want to remind you, it's interesting that there isn't one single deed mentioned in this, like a list of sins. If we would make a list, he doesn't mention any of those kind of things. There's nothing like abortion in here. There's nothing like drugs in here. There's nothing like swearing. He doesn't mention any of the Ten Commandments. Oh, the murder thing probably, but you're, you're stretching it. See, everything that he mentions in here is about how it related to the person of Jesus. And I know probably we're pounding this and, going over it and over it, but it really is a key to understanding everything about holiness, that what God wants out of you has nothing to do with the deed at all. Oh, yeah, if the deed is involved. There is no question about that, but it's the how the deed relates to the person of Jesus. In other words, everything they did wasn't about, it wasn't about a deed that they did. It wasn't the details of the deed that mattered. It was how it related to the person of Jesus Christ. See, everything is focused on him. They delivered him up. Well, that's about what they did to Jesus. See, they denied him in the presence of Pilate. That's what they did to Jesus. Uh, Pilate was determined to let him go. They wouldn't allow it. That's how it relates to Jesus. They denied the Holy One. That's all about how their relationship was with Jesus. They, he was the just one. That's all about how they denied the just one, how it related to Jesus. They killed the Prince of Life. That's all about how they felt and what they wanted and what they were into with the person of Jesus. See, it isn't about the deed of sin. The activity isn't what makes it a sin. It's how that deed, how that activity relates to the person of Jesus. That means anything could be a sin if it doesn't relate to Jesus properly. What if Jesus had an overwhelming plan for your life? Oh, what if he had a great, great plan for your life? doesn't he? What if he had more than a 70-year plan? What if he had a billion-year plan? What if he had a 10-billion-year plan? What if his plan for you was so significant that he designed you specifically for that, for that deed, for that activity, for that purpose, for that plan? What if, what if he had a plan like that and you just went off and did your, your own thing? Maybe you didn't do anything bad. Maybe you were exactly, maybe you went to church, maybe you read the Bible, maybe you did all the stuff right, but you just weren't in the Plan. Do you realize that would be as bad as anything that's ever been done? Because it isn't about the activity. It's about how it relates to the person of Jesus. Does that make sense to you? 
So if I would discipline my life and stop doing the bad thing, it wouldn't change anything because it isn't about that. It's how my life is relating to Jesus. See, everything here is how it relates to Jesus. And this is the crowd, you realize, that had the fist in the air. This is the crowd that yelled the cry, crucify him. This, this is the crowd. And you could just see them. They, it just dawns on them. It's just like a wave that goes across this crowd, and they're just, they're just dumbstruck. They just, can you see them? They, 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 they look at the floor, man. Their, their mouth is wide open. Their eyes are bugged out. They're just, oh, sickening feeling down deep inside like, oh, Everything God has wanted for us, we just blew it. You ever had that feeling? We just blew it. And of course, as we said at the end of verse 15, oh, what a statement. Whom? God raised from the dead. And the overwhelming truth of the passage is, here's this overwhelming, oh, startling, oh, staggering picture of their sin and how it relates to Jesus. And, and, and they killed the prince of life. And then over here, there's just this one simple statement, God raised him from the dead. Everything that you were a part of, everything that you participated in, everything that you pulled off in the worst of your sin, God just reversed the whole thing, raised him from the dead. Just raised him from the dead. All your guilt, just God raised him from the dead. All the separation from, an int from intimacy with him, he just raised him from the dead. Everything that you should have in destruction, he just raised him from the dead. He reversed everything in one simple statement, raised him from the dead. Disappointed. I thought you'd stand and cheer. That's phenomenal. Just that simple. All that's found in physical death. All that's found in spiritual death. All that's found in eternal death. All contained in. God just reversed the whole thing. Just in that one simple thing. Jesus raised from the dead. It's overwhelming. You know, what we want to talk about this morning is the opposite of that. God reversed. There's a phenomenal, this phenomenal reversal that's in the passage. But there is this also which is irreversible, cannot be reversed, is not reversed in the passage. And it too is just an overwhelming strong, uh, and it's all right here in the passage. And I want you to get into this with me. Number one, as you move into it, you begin to discover that what we call service or platform uh, depending on what word you like. But it all starts with this opening statement of, of the uh, exhortation, which is verse 13. And in verse 13, he says, The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus. And we preached about 10 sermons on that, glorified his servant Jesus. But the idea, of course, of glorifying his servant Jesus is that the idea of glorify is what, what you hold in high esteem. It, it, what, it's what... It's what you elevate. It's what you value. So the idea of glorify has to do with perspective, how you see a thing. And when you crawl into the heart of God, we're talking Trinity God here, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Old Testament Trinity God. When you crawl into the heart of God, what is it exactly that God just gets off on? What is it that just excites him? What is it that just, oh, he's just so thrilled he can't sleep at night? What is it that just makes him hyper? What does he bounce about? What is God just, what, what just turns him on? And he says, what God holds in high esteem is servant. Well, what's servant all about? Oh, he defines it in the passage. See, the servant is all about, it's one who has overwhelming power. It's one who has esteem. It's one who is high above. It's one with real authority. It's one who can pull off anything he wants to. It's one, as you've learned through the saying, he could have called 10,000 angels. You know, it's that kind of a deal. And what does he do? Well, he allows you to, del to deliver him up. He allowed that. He allowed you, can you imagine the 
the gall that you had and the humility and the servanthood and the love that spilled out of him when he allowed you to deny him and allowed you to choose a Barabbas instead of him. Can you, allow, can you imagine the prince of life who roars with life allowing you to kill him? And you say, well, that's absolutely ridiculous. Why would he do that? Because he's the servant. And a servant is all about this thing right here, cross style, which is another word for the servant thing, which is all about what? Well, give your life up. Which is all about what? Well, pour yourself out. Which is all about what? Well, this is not about you. This is not, why do you live for yourself? This is not about you. Which is all about what? Never ever think about yourself. Which is all about what? Well, give yourself away. Which is all about what? Come on, roll your sleeves up and wash feet. Which is all about what? Give yourself away. Now, if you come and say, well, I'm, I, I'll do that. Yeah, well, how many feet should I wash? And, well, you should, Jesus wash 12, so I guess 12 is a feet. So you, you could do 13 and beat him then. See, well, it's, see, it's not, th- and why would you do that? Well, it makes me feel good, which is right back to self, which destroys the whole servant thing. Did that compute? See, so it isn't about a list of things. It's about an attitude. It's about an inside thing with you where, whereby you don't do it to get. You don't do it because it'll, it'll derive benefit. You don't do it because, well, it's a thing to do and I ought to. You don't do it. You, just, you can't help yourself because it's just, it's just in you and you just pour your life out. You just... All my life, I've lived for myself. All my life, I've grabbed for me. All my life, I've defended. All my life, i said, well, I don't like that. All my life, I've said, well, I deserve, I should get, I want, I die. I, all my life, it's been I, which is the heart of sin. S I and See, it's the very essence of sin itself. So all my life, it's been that way. This is the opposite of that. Well, how, man, how about manly if I go for a combination? sorry can't combine it because they're like oil and water you just can't mix that stuff so this is about death to all that's found in I and servanthood that's what Jesus was into so his whole deal was pour your life out. Never ever live for yourself. Give yourself away. It was spontaneous. It was natural. That's why they called him the holy one and the just. Because all of his activities aligned itself with the nature that possessed him. So what's going to have to happen in my life is, oh, I'm going to have to, I've just got to, oh, it's going to, he's going to have to do something so deep within me that my very nature is changed. And God really gets off on that kind of thing. That's what he's really into. Oh, if I come and praise him, that doesn't impress him. Makes you feel good, but it doesn't impress him. He is not some kind of egotistical God that sits in the sky and says, oh, I wish Sunday would come so I could hear all my praises. See, that's ridiculous, folks. It makes you feel good and, hey, that's fine. But this isn't for him. And I know we're singing to an audience of one. I've been through all that. But he's not that way. It is his nature. His nature is repelled by that stuff. And what what he glorifies, what he gets off on is, oh, pouring your life out. So it isn't our praises that that, that thrill him. It's, oh, we rolled up our sleeves. We poured our, we loved when we could have hated and we didn't even realize we were doing it because it was just spilling through our lives. Oh, when we should have lashed back, when I should have cussed and damned, when I should have put you in your place. I don't know. I embraced you and tried to encourage you. Oh, wow. What, how did that, that, oh, God gets off on that. That's what he's really into. Now, what we've done in theology is we've developed, in the evangelical church, we've, see, if, see if this rings with you, we've developed a now and then idea. See, now Jesus is the servant. He washes feet. Then! Then, one day, he's taking off his Calvary love gloves. and He's going to smash you. It's a now and then theology. See, now is the hour of grace. Then! See, now he has grace upon you. Then 
judgment. Now, then, now he dies on a cross. Then he's coming back, conquering king. A now and then theology. Now, this is really significant because it not only shows up here, it literally reeks through the entire New Testament. There is no now and then. There's a now, but there's not a then. Because what he is now, he is then. Folks, he's not changing on us. Please, please hear me on this. He's not going to change on us. Whatever he is in, whatever he is in the gospel accounts, he is after the resurrection. Now, that's proved to us in the passage. Jesus is glorified in this passage. The Jesus, the glor God glorified the, his servant Jesus. The servant Jesus is at work in this passage. Well, what are you talking about? The lame man, the beggar lame man is healed. That's what the glorified his servant Jesus relates to. <clears throat> The whole deal of God glorified his servant Jesus is contained in Peter's explanation of this lame man who's just been healed. This beggar lame man is standing on his feet, dancing man in the temple for the first time. Woo! What just happened here, folks? Oh, God, the Trinity God just glorified his servant Jesus in this man. So Jesus is still serving in this man. And I want to go to Jesus and say, Jesus, you picked the wrong dude. Oh, yeah, he's a lame man. He's 40, over 40 years of age, and all he's ever done his entire life is beg, con, and get money from people and never work. If I was going to do something for somebody, I'd do it for a decent guy, not... <laughs> Come on, confess, you would too. See, somebody, I want to help worthy people. Well, that eliminates you. <laughs> See, if you only help worthy people, you won't help anybody. So what does Jesus do? He pours his life out for the lowest. He pours his life out for, he's still doing that. He did that. He's still doing that. His crowds were full of those guys. They're still full of those guys. And here he is resurrected sitting at the right hand of the Father and, this, and already poured the Spirit out. And what's Jesus still doing? Pouring his life out for lame beggars. Pardon me. Yes! Isn't that phenomenal? Because that means I have a chance. Because in all of my strutting around and all of my big shot stuff, down underneath it all, I've been by the gate beautiful for 40 years. God glorified his servant Jesus. That has not changed. That is irreversible, this servanthood stuff. Let me give you another example that's in the passage itself. Another example in the passage itself is of, wh of which we are witnesses. Peter says, we witnessed this thing. What did we witness? Oh, the resurrection. But what was the resurrection all about? The resurrection of the servant Jesus. And we were witnesses of that thing. Witnesses, the disciples. How are they witnesses? Well, we'll get into this a little more detail but later, but how are they witnesses? Well, they saw the resurrected Christ. Don't you think it's interesting that when Jesus split the grave wide open, I mean, he died on a cross, all the pain and agony of that thing, went down into the grave, went to hell, went to wherever, however, and, and, and went through all of that and literally conquered death and hell and the whole penalty is paid, wiped his hands, said, hey, I got the job done. He pops out of there. He's now resurrected from the dead. You know what I'd identify as in his shoes? I am am out of here whoa man goodbye world i'm gone i'm headed home i'm going back thrown here i come i would i'm not messing one more listen i've done my part i'm not doing one more thing down there on that i've done all I, i've that's what i'd have done he hung around 40 days in a 40-day resurrection appearance and you know how he hung, why he hung around? <gasps> the multitudes, tens of thousand people. No, 11 saw him for 40 days. What's that all about? 
his servant Jesus. See, it's this thing. It's, oh, I got to convince you. Oh, I want this so drilled into your mind. I want you to so see me. I want you to spend 40 days with me, man. I want you to get up with me in the morning and go to bed with me at night. I want you to see me with my hair all messed up and smell my bad breath, my morning breath. I want you to eat fish with me over the fireplace. I want you to know when this is done, wow, this boy was raised from the dead. That Jesus, I want you absolutely convinced of who I am. And I'm willing to spend 40 more days, man, just getting through to you. Want to talk about your 40 days, which went on to 60, which went on to 90, which went on to years, when he just kept beating on your door and would not give up, who he, the Jesus who's hounded you, that's the servant thing, man. It's still going on. See, I'm trying to tell you it's not a now and then thing. I'm telling, trying to tell you this servant thing, this pour your life out, this never ever live for yourself is the bottom line of kingdom stuff. And it's always. Let me give you another example. These Jews, I wouldn't have messed with these Jews, the ones that he's actually preaching to right here. He's talking to these Jews. These are the Jews that crucified him, man. These are the Jews that yelled for his blood. These are the Jews that pulled this off. These are the Jews. I'd have smashed them. I wouldn't have messed with them. I, I would have come back in my resurrection power, and I would not have... I, He's serving. You know what he's going to do to these Jews? He's convicting them of sin, and then he's going to radically bring the peace of God to their inner heart, and they're going to become a part of the early church, and there's going to be 5,000 of these men who are going to get saved. Why? Because he's the servant Jesus, and that's his style. See, he wasn't just that way. For gospel accounts, he was that. He wasn't just that way before his his crucifixion and resurrection. He, he, he's that way now. Let me give you another example: leaders of Israel. Now, there's one group I would have definitely I snobbish, aristocratic, all dressed up in suit and ties. I wouldn't have messed with those. Proud, arrogant, push people around type people. I'd have fixed them. You know what he did? In this very scene, folks, in this very scene, they grabbed the Peter and the apostles and evidently the lame man too who is now healed and they put him in jail over the night. And when they got out the next morning, they said, well, Peter, by what right do you have to do what you did? And Peter begins to address them. And who's standing right there? The lame man. And when Peter got done, they, they said, well, there's no question a great miracle's taken place. See, God, one more time, is trying to get through to the leadership of Israel who actually plotted and planned and did the whole thing, man. Actually, and what's he doing? One more time, I'm going to give you a witness. One more time, I'm going to speak to you. One more time, I'm going to talk to you. Why? Because this servanthood, this pour your life out, this give yourself up, never ever think about yourself stuff, that is an absolute fundamental to the kingdom and never goes away. I don't know what your favorite song is. Probably Old Rugged Cross. I'm having some problems with the song. Because this doesn't fit that. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it. Whoa. Exchange it for a crown? Wait a minute, folks. I'm not exchanging anything here. I'm going to stick with this because this is absolutely fundamental forever. And I'm telling you, when you get to heaven, you know what's going to be the heart, the fundamental, the attitude, the flow of all the kingdom of God in heaven? This thing right here. This thing right here. See, everybody in heaven is going to live with, it's going to have this attitude of pour your life out, give yourself away, never ever live for yourself. Nobody's going to live for themselves in the, in the kingdom. I mean, absolutely, no, forever and ever. Everybody's going to walk with this same lamp. Everybody's going to have this same skip. Everybody's going to jump through this same hoop. This is going to be the fundamental. Everybody's going to look at everybody else and see, ah, oh, you got it too, don't you? Because this is the deal. Because God really gets off on the servanthood thing, the pour your life out, the never ever live for yourself, the die to yourself stuff. I 
I know it's hard. I want to walk through your life this last week and think of all the expressions that came out of you and were they self-sourced or a flow of the servant nature. I'd sure like to get into your life and analyze that with you, but I've got my own to do, sorry. Wow. Let me give you the second thing that's absolutely irreversible. Absolutely irreversible. One thing that is not reversed, not reversed, is this fundamental of this servant, this servant Jesus. It's the platform of the kingdom. The second one is the spectators or the plan idea. He says in verse 15 of which we are witnesses. Now, in that phrase, we is the subject, R is the verb, it's the me, uh, a me thing, which is the uh, I am, I am that I am kind of stuff. So it's a state of being, and witness then, that makes witness a, uh, a uh, predicate noun and or a subjective complement, meaning we and witnesses are the same, and you can flip it. So witnesses are we, or we are witnesses. So it's not something they do, it's that which they are. So it's not an activity of going around and witnessing, it's the essence of who they have become. Now, come on, track with me on this. This could matter for your life. Nobody ever was a witness to the resurrection. Noun. The event. See, in Matthew chapter 28, verse 1, the ladies got up. They looked like they'd slept in their clothes. They hadn't slept much that night at all, grief-stricken. They have spices in their hands. It's, they're heavy. They're lugging them down to the, to the grave because they want to redo, re touch up the, the, the dead body of Jesus. They think he's dead. They don't know how they're going to get into the tomb. They go down there, and when they, as they come down there, earthquake, why? Angel is descending, earthquakes, and the angel rolls back the stone not to let Jesus out. He'd been out for several hours. In the middle of the night, in the middle of the morning of that day, in the middle of the early morning of that day, Jesus had already left. Nobody rolled the stone away. He's gone. Resurrection has already taken place. Stone is rolled back, not to let Jesus out, but to let us in. So we got in there and looked around and said, yeah, he is gone. (laughs) See, when did the resurrection take place? Nobody saw it. So technically, nobody can be a testimony, a witness to the resurrection. I was there. Yeah, I saw the grave clothes tremble. Whoop, I saw, whoa, and they all clapped. No, nobody can say that because nobody was there. And yet over and over and over, it says they were witnesses. But note how it says it in this this passage. This is very significant. Of which we are witnesses. What did they witness? God raised him from the dead. Now, we can witness that. Why? Because, hey, 500 of us were in one spot and saw him. (laughs) So he must have been raised from the dead. Why? Because we saw him die. Then later we saw him walking around. Oh, yeah, we spent 40 days with him. So we know he was raised from the dead. So they're not witnesses of the event. They are witnesses of the fact, the reality that he's raised from the dead. In fact, the whole fundamental of being an apostle as you walk through the book of Acts is not not that they are organizers of the church, not that they do church planting, not that they're the minister, they're not the general superintendent. What they are in in the scriptures is they are witnesses of this raised from the dead stuff. They just went around and said, yeah, we saw him, yeah, we saw him, yeah, we saw him. Hey, he's raised from the dead. And not only that, but the Scripture's very clear on this, that they not only testified about they'd seen him, but when we looked at them, when we got in their presence, there was something of this life that was just emanating out of them that was so startling to us. We saw the demonstration of the resurrection of Jesus. So the apostles went around doing miracles. Do you know very few people in the New Testament ever in the, God, in the book of Acts ever did miracles outside the apostles? They did them all. Why? Because they're testifying of the divine action of the resurrected Christ. And so they are literally a demonstration of the life. 
Jesus is raised from the dead. Why? I know it because I see him in you. The apostle Paul helped us. He said, oh, listen, I'm also saw him. The resurrected Lord appeared to me. Yeah. Bright light. Knocked me off my horse. I was born, he said, out of due time. Now, if the apostle Paul can claim that, stand aside, boy. Here I come. Could I tell you I'm a witness of the resurrection? Not the event. Of the reality. He is alive. How do you know that? I've seen him. Seen him? No. Seen him. Embraced him. Felt him. Known him. He moved into my life, man. He changed my whole, oh, he just changed my whole deal, my whole life. I'm telling you, the, I, not theology. Listen, I, get off that. Philosophy? No, no, no. Meditation? No, no, no. You know what? Pills? No. You know what I got into? The real life Christ showed up in my life. And, And what do you want me to say? Well, your parents taught you. They didn't teach me that. See, I can get over what my parents taught me. I have a lot of it. I, never mind. Well, the church taught me. No, I've got over a lot of what the church taught me too. But this resurrected Jesus, man, I'm a witness. I'm a witness. So that doesn't change, folks. The indwelling presence of the living Jesus manifesting himself in our world is still here. It's irreversible. Oh. Let me give you one more. There's not only this uh, participant, the spectator thing, uh, and, the, uh, and the first one was the, what's the servant thing, but there's this scheme or plan. It's interesting that in the passage, he starts out by addressing them as men of Israel, which talks about what? Oh, the Old Testament and all that hey, you're connected with, and hey, the Messiah is going to come, and God has a plan, and brought your nation together for the purpose of, and God has a big plan for you. Then he expands that into verse 13, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers. And what's he doing? Oh, he's expanding it some more, because this is the Trinity God who has a plan, and he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It was all about the plan. So God has this phenomenal plan that he's just unfolding, and he's bringing it around. And he moves into this passage and says, oh, you tried to block the plan. But guess what? Couldn't be blocked. It's irreversible. You denied Jesus. Didn't get it done, though, did you? I mean, you, you delivered him up. Yeah, I know. You got him cursed. You killed the prince of life, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know what God did? He is so wise. God is so omniscient. God has got it so together. He's not playing chess with the devil. Oh, you move there. Oh, I got to move here. No, the devil does not determine his moves. What God does is he's so omniscient that he calculates in all the evil of your life, calculates it into his plan, and somehow utilizes it to glorify himself. And God saw exactly what was going to happen and calculated all his plan and utilized everything that you boys did because you couldn't stop his plan. It's irreversible. Regardless of what happens, regardless of what goes down, regardless of who the president is. Guess what? We win. We win. Why? It's irreversible. Now, don't take that on a big scale. Bring that down to your life. Come on. I shouldn't have to even begin to convince you of that. The fact that you've got a fingerprint that's different than anybody else. The fact that your DNA isn't like anybody else tells you that there is a significant God who has a significant plan, who has significantly built you at a significant point in history for a specific, specific reason. And that you matter. <laughs> Duh! Why wouldn't you want in on that? Why would you want to fight against your own DNA? Amazes me, man. Just amazes me. We'll kill ourselves. We 
which again, as I've told you over and over again, it isn't that God does, isn't going to come back and judge us. No, he's not going to come back as a judge. The cross was already the judgment. The, John says that. Well, isn't there going to be judgment? Yeah, you're, you're judging yourself. You're taking a gun and shoot yourself in the foot. Sin destroys itself. Because it's not in the plan. And here's this phenomenal plan that's written into your DNA. This, this, this significant plan that's found in your fingerprints. The uniqueness of your personhood that God has dreamed about for your life. Just yes. Just yes. Just yes. Why not? And the whole sin of these Jews was what? They tried to block the plan that was irreversible. Jesus, I yield. Jesus, I surrender. I've raised my fist. And all of my sin and all of my guilt and everything that's been out of whack, you just, in a one split moment, raised Jesus from the dead. And you reversed all of that. And forgiveness is mine. And grace spills upon me. And your love embraces me. And I accept all of that. But God, I also am so grateful this morning for that which is irreversible, cannot be changed. And you got this one thing you're stuck on. Oh, Jesus, would you bring me to death? Oh, Jesus, would you literally spill your nature through me? The nature of never, ever live for yourself. The nature of spill your life out. The nature of always be redemptive. The nature of never pulling from to myself. The nature of not be protective, guard. The nature of openness and response and give myself away. Forgive me, God, for losing my temper, protecting myself. Forgive me, God, when I'm so stuck on myself that I can't see the hurt of others. Come on, God. Forgive me when I'm so embarrassed by what so-and-so did in my family that I can't embrace them anymore. Give me your nature and let your nature literally spill through me and manifest the fact, the reality that you are raised from the dead because you're walking my streets in my flesh. And you are literally being seen in me. And the fulfillment of your overwhelming plan is taking place in my life. As you move my world. In the name of Jesus, claim every one of us this morning. In the name of Jesus, we're facing a week. Who knows what this week is going to bring. In the name of Jesus, we're facing this week with all of its pressures and all of its realities. And a lot of us are in the middle of a lot of hurts and a lot of struggles, God. Could you captivate us today with the wonder of your life and your living in us? Could you captivate us today with the wonder of your plan that we are in the middle of a flow of redemption and pouring our lives out and you're doing something that's so big in our lives for us and our family that it is staggering. Capture us with that. Oh, heads are bowed. wants you to yield to him in a deeper way. Maybe you haven't met him face to face. Do that. Oh, for sure. But I, I want you to just yield to him in a, in a deeper way, wherever you are in your spiritual journey. I just want you to just yield to him today.
in all of your discouragement in what you what feels like the weight of a world and all of the defeats come on friend he waved his hand jesus is raised from the dead he's reversed your defeat he's reversed your guilt he's reversed all of that embrace him today be in the middle of the plan You have no idea the significance of his dream for you. Would you seek him today? Don't let anything blockade the, that which is irreversible in the kingdom. Would you be available for him to pour his life out through you? Would you become the demonstration of who he is? Could he claim you in this hour? Alders open. Oh, I'm, I, I want to be his. Got to be his. Fulfill your dream in me. Remove everything that's not a part of the dream. Hey, God, I'm not going to hang on to anything. Hey, Jesus, I'm not hanging on to anything. I let you choose, Jesus. Let's seek him together.